fine. By grace alone, I ex expect to live it and to prove it and make, its mi make it mine. When I first got saved, there was a lot of things that I thought I believed in the Bible that really I knew I didn't. And one of them was uh, Genesis. The book of Genesis is called The Beginnings. That was how God created the heavens and the earth. He did it so simply, it only took him six days. For people who think they're smart, by evolution, it takes billions of years. Our God's pretty great. He can do it in six days. But evolutionists, they're still trying to figure out how he can do it in billions of years, and they keep having to add time to it because they don't have enough. But this morning, uh, I'm going to look at the first few chapters of Genesis and mainly deal with chapter 3. Last week I spoke on uh, patience, and uh, as the Lord is faithful, uh, one of the verses my daughter's learning is, uh, the Lord will hear me when I call to him. And as I asked the Lord to work in my life to give me more patience, he certainly did that even on the way home. His big truck passed us and buried us in snow and slush, and as I put the windshield wiper on the wiper went, <laughs> and there. And so my wife and I were sitting there, and we're laughing and saying, thank you, you know, patience is definitely what we need. <laughs> and, uh, and the week kept going just like that. Just before we're ready to go, we're all in the van, we're all packed and all set to go, and the grader goes by. Piles it all up in front. <laughs> and then there, ah, the Lord had them come today just to work on patience. So we're going to talk a little bit about temptation and look at the first fall. But back, chapter 1 deals with how God created the heavens and the earth, and it describes quickly how he did it in six days. Now in chapter 2, starting at verse 7, he goes into a little bit more detail of how he made his last creation, the greatest creation for him, and it's when he made man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now God tells us here, notice it says the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim formed man of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It goes into detail how he had made him. If you look back in chapter 1, God simply says, let this take place, and it took place. Let there be this, and it, let, and it did. But with man, he said, let us go and make man in our image, and then it tells how he got formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He's showing that there's something different about man. He made him specially. He made him out of ground that he had already formed, but he breathed into him life. Without that life in him, he would still be part of the ground. He wouldn't be alive. Then it says that God had made a garden in Eden, and they took and he put man in it. Now verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay, he has him, he puts him in there. Notice man has not yet fallen. And he told man, you're to work the garden. You're to till it and to keep it. There is nothing wrong with work. God created man before to do a job, to work. A lot of people today say, well, work is really not good for you. The human body is made in such a way that if it just sits around, it dies. The muscles atrophy, everything like that takes place. That's a proven fact. 
You can take a piece of machinery and buy it brand new and, and let it sit there and two years later go and start it up and it'll run and it's fine. Take a human being and let it sit there for two years. Try to get that person to walk. You can't do it. God made man to work and he's meant to work. And if he doesn't work, he is slowly going to deteriorate and die quicker. So man, when he was made, God knew his, his need. He made him so that he would work. But he gives him a command of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die now verse 18 and the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone I will make him a help fit for him and out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now notice, God had made man out of the ground and he brought to him every other creation that he had made that it was also made from the ground. And he brought it to man. And Adam named every single one of them. In intelligence, he was able to do that. Verse 20, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a help fit for him. Of all of the animals and all of the birds, all of that that was brought to Adam, there was nothing that Adam found that was able to be a help meet for him. Help me. Somebody who could work alongside him. Now notice, God had all along in the beginning of Genesis been saying after he did something, it is good, it is good. But now he says, it is not good for man to be alone. Okay. And in verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had made, had taken for man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So God goes and he makes woman. And he brings her to Adam. And Adam, the moment he sees her, he says, This is the one. This is my help. Me. This is the one to be beside me all the days of my life. This is the one to be with me. Now, it's not Adam. I don't believe it's Adam who says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I believe that this is God defining what marriage is to be here. Because Adam didn't have a father or mother. But we know now from there that when a man marries, he's to leave his father and his mother. He's to leave that household, and he's to set up his own household. And the two shall cleave, unto his, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Although they are two bodies, they are one. The number one here signifies one in unity. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord thy God is one God. Plurality, but unity. The same meaning. And also in Scripture it says, the nation of Israel went down as one. Plurality, but yet united. Okay. There are people who are married here and they know that the wife that the Lord has given them is the best one for them. The best one for them. And they are to cherish her as their own flesh and to nurture and to feed her. And in Ephesians it takes that and it applies it in a spiritual sense and takes it even higher than just a physical sense. The spiritual sense as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands are so to love their wives. And that's so important for us. When we love our wife the way Christ has shown he loves the church, we have a witness to the world of the love that God has manifested. And that's one thing that each one of us who is married needs to keep in, in our families. Show that to our children, that we love our wife and that she is my helpmate. And for the wife also to love the husband and to recognize that God has placed him there in a position of responsibility and to help him and to pray for him. And he calls her woman. Now he's going to give her another name later on in Genesis chapter 3, but he calls her woman because she's taken out from him. 
And it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They, had, they were totally naked, no clothes at all, and yet they had no problem with that. They had no evil thoughts. There was nothing wrong with that. And their relationship was not built on physical, but there was a bonding of spiritual bonding. Now, in Genesis chapter 3, other than Genesis chapter 1, people don't disbelieve it. As you say, God could not create everything. The next major chapter in the Bible that they argue against is Genesis chapter 3 because it presents the fall of mankind. And if people accept Genesis chapter 3 as being true, then they have to acknowledge that God is a holy God as he threw them out of the garden and their need to be saved from their sins or their sins. They also have to acknowledge that need. So they say, well, Genesis chapter 3 is only a myth or a lie. Well, it's not. God's recorded exactly what took place. And it starts off, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said? He asked her a question. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. We'll stop there for a minute. We have the serpent coming and asking her a question. Now I don't know if it's commonplace back there for animals to be able to talk. But this does take place there. And the woman answers the question that's given to her. And then something takes place. Doubt is given. Doubt that God really was telling the truth. That God is a liar. Disbelief. Doubt leads to disbelief. And then from disbelief, we have pride entering in. Because when she looked at it, she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She was wiser before in not eating of it. She turned out to be foolish when she did eat it. And she wasn't alone. No matter what people say, well, she went, she ate it, and then she took it to her husband and says he was with her. He was standing right there with her. And in the New Testament, it refers to the fact that the woman was deceived, but Adam transgressed. Adam heard everything that went on there, and he didn't stop it, because something was said that also caused him to think it would be wise and good. He wanted to be like God. What was the original sin that even made Satan fall? I will be like the Most High God. In fact, I'm not going to be like him. I'm going to be above him. I'm going to be better than him. Satan has no greater standard of anything than God himself. He's been in his presence. He's seen what he's like, and he also wanted to be exactly like him. But there can only be one God, one eternal God. So she gave it to her, her husband, and he did eat. So they both did it. It had been a command given, and eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before they ate of it, they were learning what it was to be good. God was instructing them in it. There's nothing wrong with the knowledge of good. It was the knowledge of evil, of disobedience. As long as they obeyed God, then it was fine. Disobedience was disobeying God. Disobedience led to what God said would take place, death. When I first read this many years ago, there's lots of questions I had about different things here. And I still have many. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Their eyes were opened. Not that they were blind before. 
but they saw things differently now. And they covered themselves because now their thoughts were evil. And it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They had covered themselves, but yet that was not sufficient for them to be able to still be in the presence of God. They now knew that they had disobeyed, and they were fearful to stand before God. So what do they do? They hide from the presence of the Lord God. And they hide among his creation. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? To me, that was always strange. Why did she call out to him, where art thou? God knows exactly where he is. But what God was trying to say to him, Adam, do you know where you are? Do you know where you are now? You're separated from me. You're hiding from me because of sin now. And notice what Adam says. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Notice what he says. I was afraid. The first time fear enters in because of sin. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now notice what Adam says. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. He says, First thing, does God wants him to acknowledge that he sinned and that he disobeyed God's command. But he doesn't do it. He's going to try to clear himself by putting the blame on somebody else. He says, God, you gave me this woman, and it's both your faults, not mine. I'm where I am. But notice what he still has to say. I did eat by his own mouth, he has to acknowledge that he did disobey God and he did eat of the fruit. And the Lord God said unto the woman, he deals with the man first because he is the most important one. Then from there he goes to the woman and then he goes to the serpent, dealing down in order. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. She can't blame God. She blames the serpent and says that he beguiled me. But she still has to also acknowledge that she did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay. He's gone down in order of importance in cre creation, from the man to the woman, and then to a creature of the field. And he deals with the, the serpent first. Notice he says, thou art cursed. Not just above, he's going to separate you from every other aspect of creation. He said, you are now going to crawl upon your belly all the days of your life. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now I had the, I thought, dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. That's an interesting statement. What's it mean? Well, it was explained to me that one of the things that a snake does as he crawls along to find out what's around him, he has a forked tongue and he sticks it out. And what he does is he catches dust particles. And that tells him all kinds of things, what's around him, what it's like out there, different things. That's his sensors. And after he's... He digests it. He eats it. He eats dust. I thought, well, that's a very good solution. That tells me what it means. But there's a greater meaning to that. Thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. There's a physical importance to that. In the Bible, it refers to defeat. Your enemies. Your enemies. You'll be defeated. Your enemies shall eat your dust. You're beaten. And the spiritual importance of this 
Because from the Bible we also know, although the serpent is an, is an actual snake, and we know that behind this we have Satan, the fallen uh, angel. And the snake crawling on his belly and eating dust all the days of his life is to remind Satan that he is already beaten. That he has already lost the battle. That God has already passed judgment on him and it is carried out as far as God is concerned. He's just for the time, not past sentence. And sent him to the lake of fire for all of eternity. And the serpent... Even when the millennial kingdom is set up, the serpent continues to still not have any legs to crawl on his belly. For all of eternity, he's going to be that way. He's a constant reminder of that fact. The fact that every day we get up and we put clothes on ourselves should remind us of the fact <coughs> that we need to clothe ourselves because of sin now. Back in verse 7, and it says, They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They made themselves garments to wear. This Hebrew word is also used in regards to the priesthood. They wore an undergarment for them to be able to serve in the tabernacle. An undergarment. And for us, it's symbolic of Christ's righteousness. We have to be clothed with Christ's righteousness to be able to once again be restored to a relationship with the Lord God, to be able to go to heaven and to be with him for all of eternity. Now, he cursed the animal. I mean, he cursed the snake. Then he says he's going to put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou, and get specific, thou shalt bruise his heel. Can we turn to Romans 16, verse 20? Or I'll, I'll read it if you don't want to turn there. I'm going to anyway. Romans 16, 20 says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. He's going to bruise Satan under your feet. That's the thou. He shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. God has made it quite plain that the one who is involved here is somebody very personal. It's Satan. In Matthew chapter 4, when we have Jesus Christ tempted, which is a parallel, we don't have any snake coming to him. We have Satan coming directly to him and doing it. Satan knows that there's no point in trying to disguise himself to do it. He comes directly to Jesus Christ to do it. And he fails completely. In regards to temptation, we have in ourselves the ability to not pass a single temptation. But in Jesus Christ, we can pass any temptation that is presented to us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Satan offers him first off just a simple thing to do. Turn it. You're hungry. Feed yourself. Well, nobody can really argue that there's any problem with that. That's not really something great. The next one he offers to him, he says, throw yourself down. He says, his angels will protect you. And Jesus Christ says, don't tempt the Lord thy God. That's wrong. We're there, yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely, that's getting pretty close to something that's really wrong. We go from something simple that we might say, well, there's nothing really wrong with that, to something we say, well, I'll get there. In the third one, there's no question. Everybody knows it's wrong. Satan says, worship me, and I'll give you everything. And we know that's definitely wrong. We never do that. And, and he's told to go. It's wrong to do that. Jesus Christ knows how to deal with Satan. And the weapons that we are used are not carnal, not our own thinking, but spiritual weapons that God provides for us. It refers to that. And we need a spiritual life. We need to equip ourselves from the Word of God to be able to handle the temptations that are going to take place. After I've spoken on this, I know that Satan is going to tempt me. He's going to tempt me with anything that he possibly can. And there's, he's got thousands of things that he can use. He does, his, his tools are the same. He's used them from the beginning of time. He doesn't have to change it. But will I stand 
in the provision of the Lord to meet those temptations and to let the Lord Jesus Christ defeat him, as he already has, looking for the answers from here and to do that. Man fell, and I'm a product of a fallen mankind. But I'm in the second Adam now, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he showed the fact that he can't be tempted because he will do no evil. He won't do what's wrong. He'll only do that which is right. And I'm in him. I have a choice. Will I yield my members as servants unto righteousness or am I going to go back and yield them unto my old ways? It's a choice each one of us makes. Now unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Any woman who's had a child will tell you that she definitely knows that it's not exactly the greatest experience she wants to have again. And it's part of what God did. Notice God does not curse directly man or woman. Do you know why he doesn't? I always wondered why he didn't. He doesn't do that because way back here in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 and God blessed them. He blessed Adam and Eve. That which he has blessed he doesn't curse. He doesn't curse them but he then provides some problems for them. He's blessed man. Then man fell. He doesn't take the blessing away because God doesn't do that. But then there's also consequences because of sin. And he says to the woman, he says two things to her. He said, you're going to have difficulty in childbearing. And it's going to cause you problems. And then he says another thing. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. It's more than just a desire. He says, and this is not a physical desire. This is a fact that says, you're going to want to be the head of the house. You're going to want to be the leader in the household. You're going to want to have the authority that I have given to man. You're going to want that. And that's going to be wrong. He said, and he shall rule over you. God has given headship. There's always headship. It deals with that in the New Testament. Whether we like it or not, there is. The reason there's nothing talked about headship before the fall because there's harmony. There's no problem between Adam and Eve they get along just fine. Adam gave the Adam was given the commandment in regards to what not to do, and he had to tell Eve because she hadn't been formed yet. So he had to tell her, and he'd done that. And that's why God dealt with him first. And then he dealt with the woman, and then he dealt with the serpent. And there's still headship. God says, even though that's the order I made, that's the way it remains. And in the unsaved world, it's taking place, it's always been taking place, this, uh, this harmony. God is a God of order, not confusion. And if the woman seeks and has the headship that her husband is supposed to have, it will be confusion in the household. She won't be happy. She was never made. Her physical build is not such that she can handle the, all this responsibility that her husband is supposed to take. And you know what? If the woman tries to take it, most men will give it to her. Because you know what? He thinks it's easier. She's got to go ahead, handle it, do it. You know what? He's not happy, she's not happy, and it just gets worse and worse. And then he says unto Adam, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the, the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. He tells man, you're going to have to work now really hard. Before you, you did a little bit of work, and the ground yielded forth fruit for you to eat. But now, you're going to have to work, and you know what the ground's going to readily give to you? Weeds. Anybody who's grown a garden knows, I don't plant weeds, they grow. I don't have to feed them, they grow. I gotta take care of food. And if I don't take care of it, the weeds will overrun it and they'll kill it. 
and then man would start but god tells man he's still supposed to be the provider he's still supposed to work now in verse twenty Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And I used to think, well, he called her Eve because now she was going to be the mother of all the human race. No. He changed her name from woman to Eve. When there's a change of name in the Bible, it's showing a change takes place. And what's the change that takes place? She's going to have children anyway. But because of what was given back in verse 15, because now Adam had sinned and death was to reign, God says in verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He said, there's hope. God said, there's hope. There's going to be a seed of the woman who is going to restore what you have lost. She's going to restore it. And because he believes God, he says, Eve is the mother of all living. Through her is going to come the seed. She's going to have children, but somewhere along, one of those seed is the one. They don't know whether or not it's going to be right away or when it's going to be, but he believes what God says. And he says, there's going to be a seed who's going to restore life. Restore life. In Galatians 4.4. 4. <clears throat> but in the fullness of time but when the fullness of time was come God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of son that's the fulfillment and we know in verse 15 because of that that the seed is referring to Jesus Christ now notice what takes place then. For Adam also and for his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. What they had done was not sufficient. God provided something better for them. He clothed them. With them. He had to kill an animal. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us. Notice, one of us. To know good and evil. And now let he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. There was a tree of life there. And man was in a state that if he had eaten that, he would spend eternity. <coughs> spiritually dead to God and damned to spend all of eternity in hell. If he'd have let him mean to that, if he'd have left him in that state. But he made it he had made a wise decision. He said, We have to we can't leave man that way. We'll remove him from that. And we'll provide him a new way of life. A new way to get to the fruit of the tree of life. Because in Revelation, it talks about the same tree again. And those that are redeemed and in heaven can partake of it. Spending all of eternity spiritually alive with God. Each one of us here has either made a choice or has yet to make a choice of where they are going to spend eternity. In a relationship with God, praising Him and worshiping Him in heaven, or praising Him and cursing him in hell. Because really when you're there, you're not going to praise him. You're going to bring him glory, but you're not going to be very happy there, and you're going to really have nothing to be thankful for there because you're going to realize that your choice was the wrong choice. And in fact, you have a choice not to go there. Because if you don't choose, you're going there anyway. And each one of us that's born into this world is born first of fallen parents. And death is uh, something that's a reality for us. This body will return to, the, to dust. But God says, I can even take that dust and return it back and make your body again, and I will do that. 
That which I have made, body, soul, and spirit, will remain. So what do we choose? Do we choose eternal life or do we cho choose to remain fallen? To remain in a state dead to God. It's a choice that each person here has either made or, or rejects. Hopefully you will make it. I've made it. I have three children who I believe one has. The other two, they don't know. But God is merciful. When my son was sick, I claimed him the promise from Jonah. When he sent them into that city, Jonah was upset. He didn't want to go in that. But when he, after he'd been there and that, God said to him, do you know that there's X number of beings there who don't know their right hand from their left hand? And you would like them to die? Who don't know their right hand from their left hand? He's not talking about adults. He's talking about children who don't know enough to be able to make a decision, aren't able enough. I believe he is gracious and he will give me the time to teach my children to know the left from the right and to know to either accept what Jesus Christ has done. For the gift of God is eternal life. My daughter knows that. My sons are harder because they're made in my image, a fallen image. And it takes a long time to teach them of what God is like and for them to believe it because I can destroy that. But one thing is God took children, put them up on his knee, and he blessed them. And each one of us who was born again is a child of his, and we're precious in his sight, and he loves us exceedingly, and he will take care of us. Shall we just pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word which tells us how you made everything, how we fell through our original descendants, Adam and Eve, of the hope that you have given to us, which you have already fulfilled through Jesus Christ, and the fact that we wait for his imminent return for us as the purchased possession of his, the body of Christ. Now, Father, we pray that you would just through this week, as the old tempter comes along and tempts us with sin, that we would first of all rely on your Son to enable us to not fall, and to sin against you. And Father, if we do fall, we thank you for the provision of his blood.